So, everybody's got an outline. Looks like everybody's got a Bible. Let's go ahead and pray together, and we'll jump right into it. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the privilege this evening we have to consider the seventh, the seventh chapter of Daniel. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to attend our time and grant us your blessing with wisdom and understanding. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we've got 27 verses to read today. Go ahead and open up to Daniel chapter 7 there. Start with verse number 1. Read through verse 28. It says 27 verses, but we got 28 verses. So, let's have a few readers. Who would be willing to read verses 1 through 8? And we're in Daniel 7, verses 1 through 8. Okay, and what's your name again? Sir? Andre. Andre is going to read uh, 1 through 8. Uh, verses 9 through 14. 9 through 14. Right, Gene's going to read 9 through 14. Verses 15 through 27. 15 through 27. Okay, Doug's got 15 through 27, and Betty will let you read the last verse, verse 28. All right, so we're in Daniel chapter 7, starting with verse number 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Sorry. Had a dream and visions of his head up on it. Yeah, just didn't sound right. Yeah. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised it up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I behold, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue from with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all of the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking of great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels like burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. And I beheld them, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even until the beast was slain. His body was destroyed and given into the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given unto him dominion, and glory, and kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion shall pass away, and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. 
I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know, know the interpretation of these things. These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose feet were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had great eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints that prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be reversed from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall word out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until the time and times, and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming for me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Okay, thank you so much for reading God's Word. What an amazing chapter, huh? Mm -hmm. And so, let's uh, begin our study here. Let's start our discussion on the main issues. Uh, first of all, structure, verses 1 through 8. What do we read about in verses 1 through 8? Four beasts. Yeah, the four beasts and a little horn power. In verses 9 through 14, then we have the picture of a judgment uh, setting taking place, and we see the eternal reign of the Son of Man, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <coughs> In verses 15 through 27, we then have the interpretation of the vision by an angel. And verse 28, the impression that it made on Daniel. And so that's the overall structure of the chapter. That's what's going on. So let's discuss it. Now point two, God gave a dream of a, you remember, of a multi-metal image conveying to King Nebuchadnezzar what would happen in the what? In the future. The dream of Daniel 2 covers a period of history that began in 605 B.C. and reaches down to the time when God sets up His kingdom on the earth. In Daniel 7... The same period of history is represented using the principle of, and many of you probably have heard this principle before, the principle of repeat and enlarge. It's the principle of repeat and enlarge. Four prophetic beasts are used to represent the history of the world as God adds more detail to the prophetic picture. So let's talk about this point here for a few minutes. So in Daniel 2, 
Uh, God gave, you remember that dream, to King Nebuchadnezzar. It was a dream of the image. You have the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and then the legs are divided into uh, the feet and the ten toes, which are partly iron and partly clay. And then you have a stone that's cut out uh, from the side of the mountain, and it comes flying at the image, strikes the image at the feet, knocks it over, uh, grinds all those metals to powder, the wind blows it away, and then the stone, what happens to the stone? Fills the whole earth. Yeah, it grows and fills the whole earth. And so four kingdoms are described in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and then God's kingdom being established. And those four kingdoms, what were the four kingdoms? Head of gold, Babylon, the arms and chest of silver, <coughs> you know, Persia, uh, the belly and thighs, that was Greece, and the iron legs, iron monarchy of Rome. And then uh, the feet with the ten toes, what did that represent? Yeah, Rome being divided, it's no longer all iron, it's partly clay now, it's partly strong, partly weak, and we find out that the Roman Empire would not be destroyed by another world kingdom, but it would basically disintegrate from within. And did history live true to that uh, image that God gave, that dream that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. So now, we're in the first year of Belshazzar, who is the last king of Babylon, so the Babylonian kingdom is the one that's ruling at the time of this vision. And Daniel receives this vision of the four beasts, which represent four kingdoms. You then have the judgment hour message and God setting up his kingdom. So same overall outline. The question, is there more detail added to the outline? Yes, there's more detail added. Raz and Daniel 2 was the broad stroke of this is how history is going to unfold. You don't have a lot of information about the head of gold or any of the other kingdoms. With the four Bs, you have a little bit more information and detail. So let's continue on. Uh, point three, uh, the historical setting of the vision. I noticed uh, this afternoon when I was reviewing this, there's a typo there. That should not be in, in the first year. That should be the historical setting of the vision is in the first year of who? King Belshazzar. So which kingdom is ruling at the time of the vision? It's the kingdom of Babylon. Um, point four, uh, let's go ahead and describe the vision proper now. You have four beasts coming up out of A, and you can add a word there. It's a stormy sea, a uh, turbulent sea. Uh, that is uh, the picture of how the vision begins. These four beasts are rising out of not a smooth sea, but what? A stormy sea. Yeah. The waters are stirred up. So, let's go ahead and fill in our blanks in this section at point number four here. Um, what we're doing here is just describing what we call the vision proper. We're not getting into the meaning yet. We're just describing what's there. So the first beast, what was that first beast? That was a lion that had wings. So you can put a lion with wings, uh, or you can put a winged lion. The second beast, what was the second beast? That was a bear. Anything particular about the bear that is mentioned? Yeah, he stood up. Kind of off side. Yeah. Uh, it stands up and one side of it is a little higher than the other. Anything else? Three ribs. It has three ribs in its mouth. So that's what you'll want to want to want to put there. A bear. If you want to put a lopsided bear, that's I guess that would be one way to describe it. That's because one side was stronger than the other, wasn't it? One side ends up being greater than the other. Yeah, yeah. we'll talk about that. 
and of course then we'll put down there our three ribs in its mouth and the command is given to devour much flesh. Now the third beast, what was the third beast? The leopard. Yeah, the third beast was a leopard. And this leopard had wings. something on it. Wings. By the way, do leopards need wings? No. no. I don't think so. This leopard is depicted as obviously a pretty fast one. Leopards are fast anyway. But uh, God adds to the this particular animal the wings. And then how many heads does the leopard have? Yeah, four heads. So this is not a normal leopard, obviously. A winged leopard with four heads. That's the description. Yeah, it has the wings. Yeah, the four wings. Um, fourth beast. Uh, what's the fourth beast? Bruce. <laughs> it just says a dreadful and terrible beast. Is there any beast in the animal kingdom like this fourth beast? No. Yeah, you don't get the picture that there is one. So we call the in in the world of scholarship, in the world of theology, they call this beast the nondescript beast. That is, there's not a beast in the animal kingdom that describes this particular beast. So we call it the nondescript beast, although its description is very clear. <laughs> we just call it nondescript because we don't have anything like this. And so we'll just say the nondescript beast. Um, how many horns did it have? Yeah, ten horns. And then uh, they're seen, after the ten horns, they're seen one more thing. What is seen? A little horn. Yeah, another horn. It's called a little horn. So it's not as big as the others, although it becomes more stout. But it's described as a little horn. And when it comes up, it does something. What does it do? Three horns. Yeah, it uproots or plucks up three of the ten horns. So that is the description of the fourth beast. And then, of course, uh, you have the ten horns on the fourth beast. You have a little horn after the ten. And then there's one more part of the vision proper, and that is after you see the activity of this little horn, then there's something that, that Daniel sees taking place in heaven. What takes place in heaven? Yeah, a judgment throne setting where you have the Most High sitting down on his throne and one like the Son of Man coming to this ancient of days and so that makes up the vision proper <clears throat> so let's just in our in our minds eye so to speak review this really quick you have the first beast the first beast comes out of the sea it's a winged lion then the next beast it's a bear that stands up and it's kind of one side stands up a little taller it's got three ribs in its mouth you have then the winged leper with four heads. It does its thing. And then you have this dreadful and terrible beast that has iron teeth. And it goes around stomping everything into the ground. And that beast then develops ten horns. And after the ten horns are developed, then another little horn comes, comes to be. And when it comes to be, it uproots three of the ten horns. And then last of all, you have this picture of this heavenly judgment scene. That's the vision. So, uh, let's go to point number five here, and you'll be able to write in more information at point number four here, because we've got to discuss the interpretation now. Point five, question, what did the four beasts represent? So let's discuss the interpretation part of the dream now. What did the four beasts Represent. Four kings that come yeah. out of the earth. 
Verse, well, well, I need to get here. 17. Verse yeah, 17. verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are for what? Kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall possess the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. If you go down to verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the what? fourth kingdom upon the earth. And so these four beasts represent the four what? Kings. Yeah, the four kings or the four worldwide kingdoms. Um, and remember, this is just, this is uh, a vision given to Daniel when Babylon is still ruling. And Daniel sees the first beast come out of the sea. It's a winged lion. And he's told in the interpretation, these beasts represent kingdoms. Uh, now for Daniel, who's alive during the first year of Belshazzar, even though he's not holding a position in the royal court like he did with Nebuchadnezzar, when Daniel sees the winged lion question, does he know which kingdom the winged lion is? Yes. Yes. How does he know? <laughs> because he lived in Babylon. Yeah, because in the, the gates of Babylon, there, there was a winged lion represented. Yeah, the, king. the animal that represented ancient Babylon was the winged lion. The Ishtar gates. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so we have, archaeologists have excavated the ancient ruins of Babylon, <laughs> and the winged lion was on all kinds of, uh, of their architecture, and also upon... Uh, many of their seals and their documents was done with the winged lion. So for Daniel, uh, he says, okay, he sees a dream of these four bees. And the angel tells him, now here's the interpretation. These four bees that come out of the sea, these four bees represent kingdoms. The first beast is this lion that has wings on it. And Daniel's like, okay, I know what that one is. Uh, and, of course, it follows the parallel from Daniel 2. Daniel 2, four kingdoms, and then God sets up his kingdom. <coughs> Daniel 7, four kingdoms, and then what does God do? Sets up, sets up his kingdom. So, we see the parallel there. It's just, with Daniel 7, like we've said, a little more information. <coughs> So then the second beast, that would be the bear with three ribs in its mouth, uh, what kingdom would that represent then? Medo-Persia. Medo um, and how does the Medo-Persian Empire reflect the symbol of this bear that is standing up and one side's a little taller than the other? Kingdoms that were not exactly equal in power. Okay. Uh, these are combined kingdoms that came together, joined forces to take over the Babylonian Empire. Uh, at first, the, uh, the Medes uh, took the kingdom and ruled for a little while. But which one of the two kingdoms would become stronger than the other? Persians. Yeah, it wasn't the Medes, it was the Persians. And the Persians ruled the then old world for many years. And so, did one become stronger than the other? Yeah. Yes. What would the three ribs in the mouth of the bear symbolize? Three kingdoms. Okay, Frank. Yeah. There were three uh, large kingdoms that had to be devoured and destroyed in order for it to rule. And what three kingdoms were that? We know one of them is what? Babylon. One of them is Babylon. Egypt. Egypt. Egypt is the other. And Lydia. And Lydia saw Rose has it down there, doesn't she? So in order for Medo-Persia to rule the then known world, it had to conquer Lydia. That's also known as Assyria. Um, some people say Assyria. It had to conquer Babylon. And the Egyptian Empire had strength at that time. Not as much as the Babylonian Empire. But uh, they took out the Egyptian uh, nation as well. Once it had the Egyptian nation underfoot and the Babylonian nation underfoot, uh, it 
was then considered the ruling power on earth. But did uh, the Medo-Persian Empire rule forever? No. What nation came in and took out the Persian Empire? Alexander the Great. Yeah, Alexander the Great, uh, representing the Empire of Greece. I wonder if, if instead of being a leopard, it was a, the symbol could have been a cheetah. <laughs> Well, in the text it says leopard. I don't know if there's a whole lot of difference between a cheetah and a leopard. But, but what does it say in Hebrew? I don't know. I've not looked that up. That's a good question. Yeah, big yeah. yeah, a big kitty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't have my Hebrew Bible with me, but uh, somebody remind me to check that out, and I'll check that out and uh, share that with you tomorrow evening at tomorrow evening's meeting. So I think some of you have my phone number here. You can just send me a text after the meeting, which reminds me I should turn my phone off. There we go. Yeah, it's so uh, how is it that, uh, or let me ask, ask it this way. Um, did the Greek Empire, in terms of how it conquered, did it match the idea of a winged leopard? Yes. Yes. In what way? Alexander yeah. the Great. Alexander the Great. He was a young man, by the way. Um, in, in in a little bit of history I've read about that young man, he probably started his world conquest like in his late teens, if you could imagine that, or around twenty. And most historians suggest that he ended up ruling the world and then dying 12 years later. So from the time he began his conquest to the time he conquered the world and then died, it was only 12 years. He died at the age of 32. He was driven, wasn't he? He was a driven young man, he was. Uh, history tells us he died in a drunken binge. Frustrated because there was nothing left to conquer. Yeah, nothing left to conquer, and he died at a party. And <coughs> uh, in, in the in the years that I grew up through junior high and high school, I was involved in things I shouldn't have been involved in. We would have called it a kegger. You know, order a few kegs, and then uh, you have a good time. Well, he drank he drank too much alcohol and he didn't wake up from it. And so he died early. Uh, his forces were not large forces. Um, in one of his last battles, uh, let's see, do I have a note on this here? Yeah. Uh, so there are three main battles uh, where <clears throat> the Greek Empire gained the world. In 334, they, we're talking before Christ, 334 B.C., they won the Battle of Granicus. A year later, in the fall, they won the Battle of Isis. And then in 331 A.D., uh, they won the Battle at Arbella. And in the Battle of Arbella, historians say that Alexander and his army was only about... 30,000 men, only about 30,000, and there were around close to, depending on what estimates you read in history on the Persian army, around a million. So 30,000 compared to about a million. And Alexander kept his forces small and they traveled light for the purpose of basically being able to run circles around the enemy. Um, the Persian army was like a bear, big and cumbersome. Now, some bears can run pretty fast, but it, does a bear in terms of speed compare to a leopard? No. And then you put wings on the leopard? <laughs> yeah. During his day, nobody, there was not an army on earth that could keep up with the speed and the efficiency of Alexander the Great's armies. And by the time he was 32 years old, 
be ruled the world. Now, Doug, I think you had a comment. The, there were several significant naval battle, battles, too. Yes. Yeah. And so a certain amount of, of the tactics of the Greeks shipping <coughs> and, and that sort of thing contributed to his, to his yeah. success. Yeah. yeah. And we believe this is, I mean, we didn't cover this detail of the vision, but since you brought it up, um, at, the, at the beginning of the vision, Daniel saw the four hands, the four winds of heaven striving upon, and in the Hebrew language, it's the definite article, the great sea. So at that time, in the then known world, what sea would have been the great sea? Mediterranean. The Mediterranean. And you read about some of these histories, uh, you read history of some of these battles. Um, that took place on the Mediterranean Sea, and it's very intriguing to read that information. So, yeah, these four beasts are seen coming up out of uh, the sea. Now, there's symbolism in that. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Um, but Daniel sees this in vision, and we believe that most likely the sea that he saw was the Mediterranean Sea, and then see these beast coming up out of that sea. That's a stormy sea. And ruling for a period of time. Um, so then, uh, Alexander died. After Alexander the Great died, what happened to his kingdom? Yeah, his kingdom was divided uh, amongst his generals. And at first, there were, he had, a, I understand, he had around a dozen generals. And so the kingdom was divided uh, to several of those generals, and they took different parts of the kingdom to try to keep order in this new world empire. And but it, it only, you know, probably 20 to 30 years later, um, those several generals it narrowed it down to guess how many? Four. Four. And does that fit the vision? Yeah. Alexander the Great goes off the scene, and within just a couple of short decades, uh, his empire was being ruled by four of his generals. Um, let me give you the names of his generals. I've got this written on the side note here. Uh, one of his generals was a, a gentleman by the name of Cassander. Cassander. And Cassander got uh, the area of Macedonia and Greece, which would have been the western part of the empire. So that was Cassander. C-A-S-S-A-N-D-E-R. Cassander. Or Cassander. Yeah. The other general, Lysimachus. L Y. S-I-M-A-C-H-U-S, Lysimachus. Spell that again. <laughs> L-Y-S-I-M-A-C-H-U-S, Lysimachus. And Lysimachus got the area of Thrace and Asia, what was called Asia Minor at that time. That would have been the eastern portion? Then? That would have been the eastern portion. The next general was Ptolemy, and that's spelled with a P. The P is silent. So P T O L E M Y. Ptolemy. And he got the area of. Does that name sound familiar to a particular area? Ptolemy. The Ptolemaic dynasty? Egypt. Egypt, correct. Yeah. So the general Ptolemy. Got Egypt in the land of Palestine. That would be down in the south portion of the kingdom. And then the fourth general was Seleucus. S E L E U C A S. Seleucus. And Seleucus got the area of Syria, which would be the northern part of the then known world. 
And so Alexander's kingdom was divided. Uh, it ended up being divided into the four generals. And as just uh, around a century goes by after that, two, this is just a little information uh, that we'll discuss towards the end of our meetings in a couple of weeks when we get to Daniel chapter 11. Um, but uh, two of those four generals then ended up conquering and ruling for a long period of time. And so you have a general in the north, that would be called the king of the north. You have a general in the south, Ptolemy, that would be the king of the south. You have a king in the west and a king in the east. Out of those four kings, which two end up having most of the strength and ruling most of the territory until Rome? Yeah, it was the north and the south. And you can read in history, in the north, that was Seleucus, and you can read in history about the Seleucus dynasty. And of course, then the king of the south, you can read in history about the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that before we're done studying in the book of Daniel. The question could you spell yes. so Lucas again? S E L E U C A S. And of course, once a nation is divided, what happens? Yeah, it's not long before it weakens and fragments and it falls. And so. Uh, in the, towards the middle of the second century BC, another kingdom comes marching on the scene. And that kingdom is the fourth beast. And what kingdom was that? Yeah, the kingdom of Rome. What historians call the Iron Monarchy of Rome. And that is symbolized by the fourth, fourth beast. And out of the four worldwide kingdoms, the fourth beast, that is Rome, ruled the longest. Uh, it was the strongest of all those kingdoms. Uh, it ruled from the middle of the second century BC to almost the fifth, well, into the well into the fifth century AD, 476. Most historians describe the fall of the Roman Empire taking place. Um, well, finally, in the year 476 AD. Um, when Rome ended up getting weak after it ruled the Iron Marquee Rome. Question. Uh, did it divide up into ten? That's the... Because that, remember, this fourth beast is seen ruling, and then after the fourth beast does it stomping all over the place, then ten horns are seen. And in the interpretation, what did the ten horns represent? That ten kings. So did the Roman Empire divide up into ten kingdoms? Yes. And so let's uh, go through these ten kingdoms. This is going to be point number seven. The divisions of Rome. Uh, yeah, these are what historians call the ten barbarian tribes that the Roman Empire was divided up into. There were the Franks, the Visigoths, the Lombards, the Suevi, the Alamanni, the Anglo-Saxons, the Burgundians, the Herguli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Those were the ten barbarian tribes that the Roman Empire was divided up into. So let's see how good we are in history. Are you ready for it? Franks. Who are the Franks? The That's the French. So the Franks are the French. The Visigoths. No more. But I don't remember who they were. Yeah. Scandinavian. Oh, the Visigoths were Spain, so that's the Spanish. So the Franks are the French. The Visigoths, the Spanish, the Lombards. Yeah, Italy. The Italians. So the Lombards are the Italians now. The Suevi? 
with Swiss, that's Switzerland now. The Alemanni, sure. that's the Germans, that's Germany. <coughs> Anglo Saxons, that's the British. That's England. Uh, what about the Burgundians? Mm -hmm. What did you say, Frank? Portuguese. Portuguese, correct. Yeah. The Burgundians is the country of Portugal now. That's the Portuguese. So seven of those ten divisions of Rome are traced to the European nations today. Uh, France, Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, uh, Great Britain, and Portugal. Now we get to the interesting point that Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, these last three kingdoms, guess what happened to them? Uprooted by the little horn. They were uprooted by the little horn. Mm -hmm. And they no longer exist today. Why was no, they no trace of them today. What was that, Frank? Why was they uprooted? Yeah, why were they uprooted? Mm -hmm. Well, we first, first of all, we need to figure out who the little horn is, all right? And then we will discuss this issue of why they were uprooted. So let's go to, uh, let's see, where are we at eight. now? Have we finished all, the, oh, so we're at number eight, you're right. Uh, the characteristics of the little horn. Let's cover the characteristics of the little horn and determine, I mean, we've got the four beasts uh, determined, we've got the ten uh, horns of the fourth beast determined. Now we have the little horn to establish. Let's look at its characteristics, and then you will be able to decide what the little horn represents. So, uh, the characteristics of the little horn. Uh, first of all, it arises from which beast? The fourth beast. So that's the answer there. It arises from the fourth beast. That is, it arises from Rome. It comes up after what? Yeah, it comes up after the ten horns. So this little horn power comes to be after the division, after the fall of the Roman Empire, after it's divided into those ten barbarian tribes. Um, it's described as being different from the ten kings. Remember those ten horns or ten kings? And this little horn is described as being diverse or different from the Ten Kings. It uproots how many of the Ten Horns? Three. Three of the Ten Horns. It has eyes like a man and speaks great things against who? Most high. The Most High God. It rules for a time times and a dividing of times and we'll talk about that by the way and it would think to change something what does it think to change times, times and laws in the context of speaking against the most high god and at last and last of all it would it would wear out or war against who saints. the saints of god so if you put all those characteristics together, I would like to suggest to you that it can only equal one power. First of all, let's mention a couple things here. It's a horn, so that would represent it's a kingdom, a little kingdom. So it, it's a, it has political power. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it also now takes prerogatives that the other kingdoms didn't take. And it takes the prerogatives of speaking against who? The Most High God. And persecrate, perse persecuting the saints of the Most High God. So it's not only interested in political conquest, but it's also interested in what? Spiritual conquest. So this power is different in that it's not only a political power, but it is a spiritual power. Historians call this little kingdom 
a political, religious kingdom. And so it would come out of Rome. It would come after the fall of the Roman Empire. It would come after the Roman Empire was divided into four. And this power, this political, religious little kingdom would uproot three of the ten horns as it comes to power. And there's only one political, religious power that did that. And what power is that? Rome in its papal phase. So Rome moves from its pagan phase and it culminates in its papal phase. We call, historians call it, papal Rome. In religious terms, that little kingdom is called Roman Catholicism. History calls it Papal Rome. So you can put down there the identity, point nine. The identity of the little horn power is Papal Rome. So, question, is there any power that meets all of those characteristics in history at the right time? Is there any power? There's none. Uh, only one power equals the little horn power. Yes? So it says it comes up from among them. What does that signify? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. It says it comes up from among them. Yes. So the among them is the ten. Yes. So does that signify that there's, there's people from, there's leave the, the prince's allegiance to it or what? Uh, yeah, good question. And it's kind of related to Frank's question, and that is, why does the little horn uproot three of the, of the ten horns? This little horn comes up in the midst of all this. And uh, the country of Italy, is the country of Italy in the midst of the division of Rome? So it comes up in the midst of that, of these ten barbarian tribes, and Justinian, who's a political leader uh, at the rise of papal Rome, Justinian basically commands all the other political nations to abide by the wishes of the leader at Rome. Because remember now, Rome is divided, and Rome, had, uh, Rome has its capital in the city of Rome, and it also has its capital where? In Constantinople. <coughs> and in the area of Turkey, it's the city now is called Istanbul. And so Rome has two capitals. The capital in the west is the city of Rome. And then Constantinople, where, where it's the capital of the eastern part of the then known world. Justinian, by the way, when Constantine moved his capital from Rome to, what was it called before Constantinople? Byzantium, is that what it was called? I think it was called Byzantium. He wants a capital in the eastern part of the then known world. And so he puts his capital in Byzantium, changes it to Constantinople. That left the political vacuum in Rome. Guess who filled the vacuum? The leader of the church did fill the vacuum and was given political power. So under Justinian's leadership, Justinian, which, who was an amazing leader, he gave power to the religious leader at Rome. But and all, all of the kingdoms basically said, okay, we'll do what Papal Rome says. But three of the ten, three of the ten said, no, we're not going to obey them. We don't agree with them. And so Justinian gave power to Papal Rome and forces to help take these guys out. And the last of these uh, tribes that was taken out were the 
put this in this there again. I always get the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths mixed up. Divine, uh, <coughs> yeah, the, the very light of Vandals and the Ostrogoths. The Ostrogoths were the last ones to be conquered, and uh, they were conquered in the year 538. So, uh, in 508, by the way, the those three uh, tribes were in the process of being annihilated. The other seven kingdoms said, okay, no problem, we'll go along with you guys. So from 508 to 538, Took about 30 years for Papal Rome to take care of those three. They are also they are called Aryan tribes. Do you know why they were called Aryan tribes? That they believed in something belief. that was called Arianism, which denied the divinity of Christ. And uh, the the Roman Church at that time wouldn't allow for that. I believe they were correct in their theology. They just didn't understand the issue of religious liberty very well. Uh, and these three kingdoms were annihilated. No trace of them uh, in modern Europe today. Uh, and so, yeah, Frank, the reason why is because the reason why the Little Horn took those three barbarian tribes out, they wouldn't go along with the program. They disagreed with them spiritually. What was that? It set a precedent. Yes, it set a precedent. And so then, let's go to point number 10 here. Uh, fall of the Roman Empire. Historians say that took place in 476 AD. And Rome and its papal phase began in 538 AD. That's when the last of the barbarian tribes, uh, those three tribes were taken out. Um, and so they ruled from 538 and ended in 1798. How many years later? 1270? Yeah, 1260 years later. 1260? Yes, the answer there is 1260 years later when Napoleon's general... Oh, I did a misspelling there. Sorry yeah. about that. That's not breathe, breathe the air, then burn the air. Uh, somebody didn't uh, check the script very well. Well, I'll have to make a note on that. It'll correct it next time. So, yeah, 1260 years later, when Napoleon's general Berthier took Pope Pius VI captive, giving the little horn its deadly but temporary wound. Uh, by the way, that is one of the characteristics of the little horn power here, is that it would rule. Uh, in the text here in Daniel 7, it does not say 1260 years. What it says is time, and then what's the next word? Times. Times, and then yeah. half a time. So if you look at that, you can go to like your Strong's Concordance or Young's Concordance, look at that word time there, and it means year. And so we're talking about three and a half times, or three and a half years. How do we know that's three and a half? Well, because... In the Hebrew language, you have time or year, that's singular. And then the next year, the next word for year is in a, what's called a dual form, meaning two. And then the next one where it says, I have a time, in the Hebrew language, that means an equal dividing of. That's why uh, theologians say, call that just a half. It's not three quarters or a quarter. It's an e the Hebrew word means an equal dividing of. So that's three and a half times or three and a half years. And we're going to find out tomorrow night, we'll have some tests for you on this, that in Bible prophecy, when a uh, day is mentioned, that is equal to a, or I should say, a prophetic day is equal to a literal year. Does that make sense? And so, how many days would three and a half years be? According to Bible calendar, that's 1,260 days. 
it's also 42 months. That's why in Bible prophecy in Daniel and Revelation, you see this 1260 year mention. You see the time times and a dividing of time mentioned. And you see 42 months mentioned. It's all talking about the same time frame. Just saying it in three different ways. And it's all in reference to the little horn of Daniel 7 and 8. And the beast of Revelation 13. Which are the same powers, by the way. Um, so, one last thing here. Last point. Then there is a heavenly judgment throne setting. A lot of times we forget about this part of the vision because we get so caught up in the four beasts and the ten horns and the activity of the little horn that we forget that the end of the vision is not the activity of the little horn. The end of the vision is what? Yeah, Daniel sees this judgment throne setting. And by the way, where is the judgment throne setting taking place? Yeah, it's in heaven, not on earth. And you have the ancients of, of days. This is God. He takes his seat. And there are those that gather around him. <clears throat> And what does the text there say? Yeah, verse 9 says, I beheld till thrones were cast down. By the way, that's the old English. The old English. When you cast something down, that meant to, guess what? That meant to set it up. <laughs> now, if some of you have a different version then it'll just simply say, uh, Daniel beheld till thrones were set up. And the ancients of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like what? Fiery flame, and his wheels as burning. So did the throne have wheels? Yes, yeah. yeah, so God's throne is able to move. Uh, verse 10, a fiery stream issued, came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and what was open? Books. Books were open. And you'll notice a little bit further there that verse 13 I saw in night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to. Who does the Son of Man come to? The Ancient of Days. So, this is not a picture of the second coming of Jesus to earth. This is a picture of Jesus coming to the Ancient of Days in this heavenly judgment scene where thousands and ten thousands stand around God's throne and books are now open and judgment begins. So, this is the deal. You have the unfolding of history. Babylon would rule, then what nation would rule? Medo you know, Persia would rule, then what nation would rule? Greece would rule, then what nation would rule? Rome, Rome would rule, and then what, what would happen to Rome? It would divide up into the ten barbarian tribes. After that, then the little horn power comes along, and what does it do? Up roots three of the ten, and then rules for how long? 1260. 1260 prophetic days or literal years from 538 to 1798 and then after 1798 so as you're coming to the end of the 18th century and moving into the 19th century you know that something sometime after that you know that something is going to be happening in heaven what's going to be happening in heaven a judgment, a judgment setting is going to take place and begin. And that's chapter 7 of Daniel. You and I are living in the time frame where this judgment hour setting is taking place. And when that's done, Christ is going to give a fair judgment against the little horn uh, judgment's going to be pronounced against the little horn. 
and in favor of who? The saints of the Most High. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Rose. I got a question. It's number 12, verse 12 of that. It says, as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. I kind of understand it, but I want you to explain it. Yeah. Um, as these beasts or kingdoms were removed from the setting, um, they're being described as their lives are prolonged. So what would that mean? For example, Babylon no longer rules the world. Persia is now ruling the world. But there's still a little Babylon left. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. So question. Yeah. In the Persian time, were there still Babylon influence yeah. Yeah. in the world? Yeah. yeah. We still have it now at the 12-hour clock. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. But the Persian Empire, or the, I should say the Neo-Persian Empire, set up a representative form of government, and they took a lot of good ideas from the Babylonian Empire. So let's take it another step further. Persia goes off the scene. Greece now rules. Greece is ruling the world. Persia is not. But in the world, is there still Babylonian Persian influence? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so then Greek goes off, Greece goes off the scene. Rome rules the world for almost six centuries in its pagan phase. Uh, in the Roman uh, world, it, are there Greek influences? A lot. There's a lot. Historians call it the Greco-Roman world. And there was also still Persian and Babylonian influence. In Rome, they had, there was still strong, uh, heavy influence from what is called Greek philosophy. Yes. Yeah. You know? well, they called it pagan Rome. What was that? They called it pagan Rome. Yeah, they called it pagan Rome. Uh, because they, Rome was, uh, accepted a lot of uh, Greek philosophy and Greek reasoning, which was a little bit on the weird side, by the way. Yeah. Wednesday there was discussion about them um, putting the family of them in the fire with the, or in the lion's den, and we were discussing the concern about that. Well, when God brought the Hebrews into the promised land, they took out every, they were commanded at least, yeah. to take out everybody, yeah. and the I mean, that's the same, that's to avoid this situation. Yeah. When yeah. you go in with my rules and my laws and my commandments, yeah, good point. If, good you, point. if we leave these people standing, you're going to take their influence. Yeah, that's going to set yeah their people. influence is going to have effect in your culture. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. It, you, you have to look back a little bit further. I don't think it was ever God's intent that they should go in there with generals and fight. He said... Just stand back. I'll send. I'll send the hornet ahead of you. Uh, I'll, I'll root him out. My yeah, way. you have clear examples uh, when uh, the Promised Land area was being conquered by Israel. For the most part, it was conquered by God. Oh, yeah. You do have a couple of instances where God tells Israel, "You go in and and." Only God can make a call like that and get it right. Does that make sense? Because that wasn't his first his first wish. He was working with them because of how they wanted to do it. Yeah. Was it yeah, there were just a couple of nations that you know, evident my take on it, evidently they got bad enough to where they were beyond uh, reach, so to speak. You know, Jesus talked, when Jesus would come on the earth, Jesus would talk about the unpardonable sin. And, you know, God makes a call on a couple of nations. And, again, only God can make a call like that. Man can't make calls like that because we're going to get something wrong. And when it comes to human life, we can't get it wrong. Uh, so, God makes a call. But for the most part, yeah, for the most part, yeah, God just told His people, you go out to battle, and I just uh, finished a two-part sermon series uh, in my other church there on the story of when King Jehoshaphat went to battle against the nations that were surrounding Jerusalem and the little area of Judah. And the prophet Jehaziel told 
the king and the people. You guys don't need to worry. You don't need to be afraid. The battle is not yours. Who does the battle belong to? God. And the command was for the king to take uh, the people out the next day. Go out and meet the foe. And all you have to do is stand there. So King Jehoshaphat, he decides, okay, we're going out, and we're going to get all in line here, and I'm sending out the church choir to lead the way. <laughs> and the choir went out, praising the Lord, for His mercies endure forever. And when they got to the field of battle, their foe, well, there was no foe. <laughs> they were already dead, laying on. Yes, this story reminds me of in the book of Kings when some of the tribes stuck together after they came out of, I think, Babylon. And there were three that wanted to do what God said to do. The, like the three that were up there. It's like that. It's like kind of a picture, sort of, of that occurrence of, of the ten tribes. Yeah, the ten tribes, there were twelve tribes in Israel, of course, and um, they, yeah, they were divided up. The ten tribes took the northern part of the Promised Land, and two tribes uh, took the southern part of the land. And so the ten in the north were called Israel, and the two in the south were called Judah. The ten in the north ended up rebelling against God. The two in the south did the best they could for many years to remain faithful and obedient to God and to true worship. But even finally, they rebelled against God and went into Babylonian captivity. So we want to be the faithful two tribes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in Daniel 7, uh, it's just a parallel chapter to Daniel 2, but quite a bit more detail. And then tomorrow night when we study, we're going into Daniel 8, and we're going to see the vision of the ram and the ego, and the little horn comes up again. So we're going to cover things from Greece onward, and even more detail is given. And then when you get to the last vision of Daniel, chapters 10, 11, and 12, particularly chapter 11, where you have a whole chapter on the movements between the king of the north and the king of the south. Even more detail to the fine-tuned detail of God saying, 600 years before the time of Christ, this person is going to marry this person. When that happens, then this happens. It'll be pretty amazing stuff. <clears throat> but for tonight, how many of you are thankful that God has an eye on the unfolding of history? And we're living, where are we at? We're living in this judgment throne setting where judgment is going on in heaven. Uh, in the Adventist church, we call that the pre-Advent judgment or the investigative judgment. And to me, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's realizing that God showed to Daniel that after the little horn would go do its thing and go off the scene, then this heavenly judgment begins. And the culmination of that is to pronounce sentence against those who persecuted God's people and sentence against the instigator behind it all, which is Satan the devil. But the little horn isn't off the scene yet, is he? Well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. We know that in history, the little horn went off the scene in 1798 during the French Revolution. But Revelation 13 tells that story of getting a deadly wound, but the deadly wound would be what? Healed. The deadly wound would be healed. Uh, by the way, are we living in the time where the deadly wound is healed? Yes. Yeah, the little kingdom, the paper roll, yeah. called Vatican City today. Um, it has quite a, quite a bit of influence around the world now. It didn't used to. Even early on in my life, in the early 60s when I was born, um, paper roll did not have a lot of clout back then. Uh, but it has much more clout now. 
did you know that next year in May, the I mean, the, the Pope has already invited the, the leaders of the nations to next year in May come to Vatican City for this, what did you say it was? Gathering on uh, global warming. No, it was about edu world what? education. World education. You were calling all the world leaders to his place. Yeah. yeah. But you remember a couple years ago, uh, what happened in, in Washington, D.C., in Congress? 2015. Yeah, what was that, 2015? So that's four years ago. Invited the Pope in and addressed, addressed the entire House and Senate. Yeah. Ha, ha, has uh, people Rome? Has the deadly wound been healed? I believe it has. Yeah. Well, we're not fully healed, but it's on its way. I remember when I was in sixth grade, the, uh, there, John Kennedy was getting elected. Yeah. And, uh, people were horrified. A Catholic in the White House. Yeah. So, yeah, back in the early 60s, yeah. you know, the feeling was there was concern about that. We can't have a president that's Roman Catholic because he might take his orders from who? From Rome. And they, America didn't want that. Yeah. Well, earlier than that, there was a, there was a big, uh, there was a, amongst the evangelical churches, there was opposition to the ambassador to the Vatican. Yes. Uh, so that was way, way, way back. Yeah, yeah. I, I had one other question. Similar to what Frank did, and I don't want to take a lot of time. There's no historical evidence of those other three tribes anywhere that one could research. Or well, there's historical evidence that they uh, were barbarian tribes that took certain parts of the, of the Roman Empire that fell. Um, but at least from what I've read, in terms of the modern nations of Europe today, uh, there's no a nation that has its root in those three. Those three were wiped out. Does it actually say they were wiped out? Well, in the King James language, they were uprooted. So you take a horn and pull it out by the roots, what's going to happen to it? It's going to die. Is there any way that could be America? Uh, you know what what could be America? The uprooted ones, like the time frame? Well, America is uh, establishing itself at that time, even a little bit before that time. But a year, America is not in the same geographic area as the Roman Empire. You know, it's across the ocean in a new land. But isn't there a prophecy about where the Lord says he will take a vine and uprooted it and plant it, transplant it on a rich and fertile hill. I just wonder if that. Yeah, it's a, any... yeah, my take on it, that's a spiritual discussion of uh, God uh, bringing the everlasting gospel to all areas of the earth. Um, the Israelites were given the task of sharing the gospel with the coming of the promised Messiah. To all the nations of the earth. That's what their task was. Were they faithful in task? No, they failed. And so Christ came and taught the world, the then known world, what the love of the Father, what the Father was like, and died to redeem us from sin. And then he gave that first century church the task to share the everlasting gospel to how much of the world? All the world. They fulfilled the task that Israel failed to do. And the idea of the uprooted plant going in other places is the gospel going to the Gentile nations and finding root and being grafted in to God's people. That's my take on that. Now, we do see the United States in prophecy in the book of Revelation, which we are not covering in this particular seminar. But we will do a Revelation seminar probably again sometime in the future where we go through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter. And we'll see that. Any other comments or questions? All right, let's stand and pray.
Would you have to go and pray for us, please? Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come together, open your word.